Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel where we discuss medical topics and lifestyle. In today's video, we are talking about diverticular disease. More importantly, we're talking about the risk factors and the diet that impacts it. So the lifestyle and the dietary factors. So we're going to be talking about fiber. We're going to be talking about uh, some basic definitions. We're going to be talking about things that you should and shouldn't eat as well. And the reason for that is because foods can be different when you're eating them for diverticulitis or diverticulosis. We'll get into all of that. So let's start with the video. So let's quickly just cover what diverticulitis is, um, how it happens, what happens during it before we dive into some of the other stuff. So we're going to talk about some risk factors and how to avoid diverticulitis. And primarily, we're going to be focusing on the diet side of things. So introduction, it's a gast gastrointestinal disorder involving inflammation of diverticula. What are diverticula? Outpouchings of the colon. So you see these small little outpouchings that happen in the colon. There's a difference between the two terms, diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Diverticulosis is a condition of having diverticula, like we said, and diverticulitis is inflammation of these diverticula. So basically what this means, these two terms, is diverticular disease. So what this means is that your colon, your large intestine, over time, for various reasons, the health and the structure of the large intestines can weaken, can get unhealthy, and they can form these little outpouchings. And sometimes these outpouchings can become inflamed. So that's the term diverticular disease, diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Now, before we get into the good stuff, we have two unavoidable risk factors that we have to just mention. So the two unavoidable risk factors are genetics and age. So age, as you get older, the walls of your large intestine, they become weaker and the pressure of hard stools passing through your intestines can cause the diverticula to form. The majority of people will have some diverticula by the time they're 80 years old. They might not get any symptoms from them, but genetics and age plays a huge role, especially so if you have family members that had diverticular disease before the age of 50 as well, you're probably going to be a bit more prone to it. So these are the two unavoidable risk factors. And then we have the avoidable risk factors, which is the focus of this video. It's lifestyle and diet. So these are the two ones we're going to zero in on now. The first lifestyle risk factor we need to address is smoking. So please don't smoke. No matter who you are, you shouldn't be smoking, especially in today's day and age when we have all the knowledge about smoking that we have. The main reason for this is that nicotine in smoking, it affects bowel contraction. And this then can promote diverticulitis and diverticular disease to happen. So please don't smoke. If you smoke, tell all your friends to stop smoking. The next one is a lack of exercise. For obvious reasons, everybody should be exercising a little bit, whether it's a brisk walk or you know moderate exercise or vigorous exercise. The reason for this is it reduces the pressure in the bowels and it improves the function. So the more you're moving, the more things are moving. Metabolic, metabolically speaking as well. So the health of the colon is good. And the other thing is at high BMI. So now we're going to tie into the diet side of things very, very soon. So high BMI, especially central obesity, this contributes to this kind of sedentary lifestyle package where there's a lack of exercise as well and an impact on the colon itself in, for developing diverticular disease. Okay, so now let's get into the diet. One last thing before we get into the diet is non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So please don't consume any uh, for prolonged periods of time. There's an increased association between NSAIDs and diverticular disease, diverticular bleeding. So that's like ibuprofen, Advil, naproxen, aspirin, those kinds of things. Okay, so now let's talk about diet. Water. Water is the most important thing, um, important liquid that we consume. So Fiber absorbs water and it helps bowel function. So you should ideally uh, be drinking about six to eight drinks per day. That's one and a half to two liters per day. So water, super, super important. Um, and if you don't like drinking water alone, then any fluid is fine. Just drink plenty of it because the less you have, the more constipated you get, the more pressure there is on the bowels, the more hard the stools become, and the more prone you are to developing diverticular disease. So dietary fiber requirements. Now let's talk about fiber, the biggest hot topic now. So these are the requirements. So around roughly in adults, we should be aiming for these kinds of ranges. So 25 grams per day, let's say uh, between 25, 30 grams, you can get numerous sources of fiber. So fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, grains. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And the reason we're consuming all this fiber is because it absorbs water. It helps facilitate things throughout the large intestine, and it helps the bacteria in our gut. We have mil millions and millions, millions, millions of bacteria in our guts, and we need to keep them happy. Otherwise, we're going to have problems in our intestines later on in life. 
All right, so we mentioned how dietary fiber can impact uh, diverticular disease briefly. We mentioned the requirements of fiber, how much we should be consuming. So let's get into a bit more detail. So how can diet, particularly fiber, affect diverticular disease and bowel function? So dietary fiber is either soluble or insoluble, and that's based on its ability to dissolve in water. So for example, the inner, so inner, inner, inner apple is soluble dietary fiber, whereas the peel of the apple is insoluble fiber. And to be honest, it doesn't matter if the fiber is soluble or insoluble. The aim of the game is to consume fiber. So back in the day, a myth was that you should eat a low residue diet. So uh, no nuts, seeds, popcorn, vegetable skins, and stuff like that, because that can get stuck in your diverticula and cause problems. That's a myth. There's no evidence to support that. The aim of the game is fiber, right? Whether it's soluble or insoluble. Now let's talk about what soluble dietary fiber actually does and what it means. It decreases the absorption of sugars and fats. And also it serves as a food source for all those bacteria that you have in your large intestine. So that's super, very important. Insoluble dietary fiber, what does that do? So it's helpful in moving waste, waste products throughout the digestive tract. So it picks up all that stuff and it provides bulk to the stool. So these are the two components, soluble and insoluble dietary fiber. And those recommendations on the previous slide where we were aiming for 25 to 30, that's a combined amount of fiber. And the most important thing is when you're increasing the amount of fiber you eat, it's important to drink enough fluid. And now we have some really practical food sources of soluble fiber. So let's hit you with a good list. So oat bran, half a cup of oat bran is actually going to give you about seven grams of fiber. So that's huge. You know, have a cup of that, um, have half a cup of that in the morning and you're already halfway there, almost a third of the way there. Black beans. So three quarters of a cup, about five and a half grams of fiber. Lima beans, Lima beans also go the same for that. Then we have things like tofu and avocado. So tofu has just under three grams of fiber per serving. Um, that's about three quarters of a cup. Avocado, so half an avocado gives you two grams, 2.1 grams of, um, of dietary in soluble, soluble fiber. And then sweet potato, sweet potato, almost two grams, so 1.8 gram of half a cup of sweet potato, and then asparagus. Asparagus, another half a cup of asparagus gives you almost two grams of, um, of dietary soluble fiber. So here's some really practical uh, food sources of soluble fiber that you can really, really easily incorporate into your diet, and there should be no excuse for not hitting the uh, requirements of dietary fiber. In fact, it's crazy to think about how the average human, the average citizen, does not hit the daily recommended dose of fiber. I think they're hitting like half of it or something like that, according to statistics. Now let's do some food sources of insoluble fiber. So we have wheat bran. So half a cup of wheat bran, 12.5 grams of fiber. So that's crazy. That's a big, big amount of fiber. And then we have kidney beans. So half a cup of kidney beans or navy beans, around between eight and a half to nine and a half grams of fiber. Lentils, lentils are another good one. So half a cup of cooked lentils is going to be 7.8 grams of fiber. So that's huge. We have black beans as well. So they have insoluble and soluble fiber. Um, they also hit around seven and a half grams. Okra, so uh, half a cup, 3.1 grams of okra. Okra is awesome. You guys should all try it. Um, turnip, half, half a cup of cooked turnip, also 3.1 grams of insoluble fiber. So really, really practical stuff. Um, and then finally, we got some peas. So half a cup of peas, everybody loves peas, around three grams of insoluble fiber. So really a combined total, we should be hitting that 25 to 30 grams per day. And there should be no excuse, you know, have, have, have a cup of, half a cup of uh, oatmeal, oat bran for breakfast, wheat bran, and we'll be there. Important distinction to make. We have a list now of high fiber foods and low fiber foods. The reason I put low fiber foods there is because um, when we're having a diverticular flare, if you're if you're having an acute episode, your appetite may be poor. And it's also recommended to uh, avoid the foods that are poorly digested or high in fiber, such as onions, nuts, seeds, fruits and vegetable skins, whole grain cereals, because they can irritate the bowel. They make things fly through. So stick to plain foods which do not irritate your bowels while you're having an acute flare up. And then once you're fine, build back up to that nice, nice, nice daily dose of fiber. Hope you learned something. This is a really fun video to make. Please like and subscribe for more. It really helps the channel. Leave a comment in the section below and we'll see you in the next one. Take care.